is one of my huge concerns is that our legislators, they're illiterate about this tech. Completely. Let's be honest, many, especially GOP senators, don't know how to use email, which, I mean, you are the first guy to, didn't you actually create the first email system in the world? I created the first email system, and we have to be very clear, there's no controversy on this. Uh, the exchange of text messages between computers and electronic devices is not email. That would make Samuel Morris the creator of email. Email is what I created as a 14-year-old kid in Newark, New Jersey, before I came to MIT in a small medical college solving a civilian problem, helping secretaries who had this very complex system. They were the managers of it in most organizations. Women who had a typewriter on their desktop, was physically a desktop, an inbox, an outbox, they had physical file folders, they had trash cans, they had the little uh, paper clips, they had white out to change things, they had paper to create carbon copies, right? And this was a very complex system called the inner office mail system. System's a key, about a hundred different complex parts. And I converted that to the electronic version in 50,000 lines of code, didn't write 15 minutes of code to simply add text to the bottom of the file, which is what Raytheon and the defense companies did, which they conflated to be quote unquote email after I was the one who called it email and discovered it and invented it in 1978 as a 14 year old boy, before I came to MIT, before the military industrial complex. And that system I named email, got the first United States copyright, recognizing me as the official inventor of email before the Supreme Court started recognizing software patents. So wow. yes, Mike, so I've been involved two lives with email. That was the first life. And when it gets to AI, it's a good point to start in 1993. Uh, many people over the age of 40 will know this is the first email systems you'll remember were deployed in the intranet, in inter-office systems. You didn't That's need right. the internet, right? So people between 1978 to 1993, email was deployed where people connected machines and local area networks or wide area networks. We put email running on it and it was an inter-office application mimicking the inter-office paper-based mail system. That's right. After 1993, when the World Wide Web came, www, which gave the front end to the internet, e email becomes a consumer application. Hotmail, Yahoo, recreate what I had done in the framework of the web. And that's when email volume takes off, right? Because in 1993, I would do huge seminars on the internet's coming. Hey, build your website. People say, what are you talking about? And if you <laughs> raised in a room of about a thousand people, how many of you had an email address would be about two out of a thousand. I remember those days because I would tell people, what's your email address? And they would say, what's that? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and everyone listening needs to recognize that prior to 1993, email was not a consumer application. Nerds used it, office workers used it. We worked in companies. But after 1993, the email becomes a consumer application. So if you take 1993 to 1997, something profoundly important takes place where AI becomes necessary. And where I get, again, involved in this, what happens is, is so 1993, people start using email, people start getting these free email accounts. If people remember Hotmail, Yahoo, et cetera, AOL. But by 1997, the email usage had exceeded snail mail usage. And there's a wonderful graph people can look at in 1997. If you do the x-axis is years and the y-axis is volume, you'll see snail mail volume is coming down and email volume is going up. It's a very interesting cross point. That's 1997. And at that point, I had just started a company in 1994. I had done my engineering work at MIT in electrical engineering, had come back to MIT to start my master's work in uh, theoretical mechanics in a field called wave propagation and was doing another master's over at the media lab in scientific visualization of very complex data. And then I started my PhD in 1993. And my PhD was called information cybernetics. It was really the AI before AI at that point. What, we, what I was developing was a broad platform to analyze any kind of pattern. So anyone who's heard the word AI for a second, replace it with the word pattern recognition. Uh -huh, pattern right. recognition is really the guts of artificial intelligence. Absolutely. Right? So in many, many different fields, people are developing these quote unquote pattern recognition algorithms. In the field of cardiology, people are looking at different ultrasonic waves from the heart, trying to predict, oh, what kind of uh, heart disease does someone have? In the field of ultrasonic non-destructive evaluation, the military would send waves through aircraft wings and see the wave coming back and trying to predict, was there decay in the wings versus opening up a $100 million aircraft wing, right? Right. Um, in, in the field of face analysis, people are analyzing a face and wanted to predict what race they were, what their emotions would be. So you can apply pattern recognition to any field, handwriting recognition, voice analysis, et cetera. What I had come to conclude in the middle of my PhD was that all of these little fiefdoms of scientific research were doing their own little siloed version of three fundamental processes, which are the fundamental processes of artificial intelligence or what I call pattern recognition. So I want everyone to listen carefully. What is 
use AI and what are those three processes? The first process is called feature extraction. The second process is called clustering. And the third process is called learning. Feature extraction, clustering, and learning. And this is really the foundation of, frankly, intelligence. We need to build a bottoms-up movement. Go to shivaforpresident.com and volunteer.